projection. Hope you can see it. Is this big enough? Okay, so after the somewhat uh, upsetting break, uh, what do I do now? I didn't have to do this the first day. But I, I didn't have to do this the first day, so I don't know why this is. Hmm? But why didn't I have to do this the first day? It's also very small, you see. No, just leave it. It's okay. Yeah. As if I change the resolution, I'm not sure uh, if, it's, if it goes back to the usual. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, what I'd like to do in this last lecture is to go over uh, what we've done in this course. So we've discussed the Lagrangian all the way to complicated final states. And uh, let's go over a number of things again. So we had seen, we had looked, we started the course by looking at the Lagrangian of QCD as a beautiful and simple thing, but with a consequence, has some consequences, and we had discussed uh, the issue of strong versus weak coupling, the paradox that is at the heart of, uh, of the strong interaction from the very strong coupling that binds uh, high bonds together to to almost a very weak coupling if you have a high energy uh, scattering. Uh, so in high energy scattering, QCD describes quarks and gluons, and that then you can use and the weak coupling to use perturbation theory with. That's what we've been uh, concerned with most. So we had seen that the QCD is a solution to the paradox. This is really getting a bit uh, difficult. And the HDMI used to work. So I don't know why this is the case. Hmm? No, this is a keynote. This is not a PDF. I need the keynote. So, you sure this? this I would use this the first day. Yeah? in the right place. Disconnect the heat, the uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
This connected to your read PID. You sure it's not this one? It works. Okay. Okay. So where were we? Uh, here, uh, we had seen that uh, asymptotic freedom, uh, shown also by the data points, does really uh, uh, solve the uh, problem uh, of having confining at low energies and freedom at high energies. We also addressed the theory uh, from a built-up point of view by uh, examining local symmetry uh, at a very fundamental level and uh, with these matrix gauge transformations, since now we're dealing with gauge symmetry, and we have looked at ways of making things uh, invariant uh, by having, well, psi above psi things were invariant, and for this we needed to, for the derivative term, the covariant derivative, and uh, that, uh, when you uh, combine that, then you have a nice invariant term also for the action. We have been playing with the covariant derivative. Um, this is a bit of an explicit form, uh, and here as well, between the quark, uh, quarks and the, and the gluon field. And out of the covariant derivative, we have also been able to make uh, the uh, field strength tensor. And then we have everything in hand to build the field the uh, Lagrange and the Lagrange, right? And to in Lagrange, we uh, recognize what is what here with the pure gluon sector, including gluon self interactions, and here with the interactions with fermions with uh, gluons, and there's also the sum over quark flavor strength. So, this still familiar to you? Don't you know all this now? If you didn't know before, you know it now, right? So, we had then looked at uh, also a little bit at the idea of the particle model in the context of deep elastic scattering. Uh, we had seen this is now a modern box that uh, the structure function F2, in terms of which you can express the cross-section, is not independent of Q squared, at least for certain values of x here it is, but at small x values it varies reasonably, and for large x values too. Nothing too wild, it does not go here very steep, but there is definitely a scaling violation. And it is in fact logarithmic in nature, and this particular pattern of steep evolution at small x and flat, intermediate, and again a bit of large x, is perfectly reproduced 
by heat perturbed QCD, particularly by the D glass equation. So these are data taken mostly uh, at the Hera Collider in Hamburg, which ran in the uh, from the late 90s to uh, in the 2000s. Now, one thing I didn't address in the course, but so now that I'll have something new, is the evidence for QCD color. Color is a bit of a mysterious quantum number. It's always confined. You never see a free red quark. Uh, can you see evidence for it? Uh, yes. If you see here, uh, time runs from left to right here. You make, you compare producing a quark at the quark pair, that means a total E plus E minus cross section, really. And you take the ratio with respect to the E plus E minus and mu plus E minus. And such ratios are often a good idea because lots of stuff cancels out. And the real hadronic, the QCD stuff then remains. And if you compute this to lowest order with these diagrams, you get the following result. The sum over the chart the charge is squared of the quarks, so two thir four ninths from the up, one ninth from the down squared, and so forth, charm, and so strange and bop and charm. And if you wouldn't have the number three, the co number of colors three, you would find a uh, much too small number, about one. But with the color of QCD, you find three, and this is exactly also here what the data show, like the near number three here. This is a beautifully indirect a view of color, but it is there. Right? And there's other evidence too regarding the pi zero decay. So we have seen color uh, slightly indirectly, but without it, you certainly would be uh, wrong here. So we've learned a lot about QCD. Now, how do you use it in practice? Is it just a schematic uh, thing? Uh, we've learned about these tools, higher order calculations, Monte Carlo, and to run them and make some predictions, you need to put in masses part of the dilution functions, the value of alpha s, and maybe the CKM matrix elements that mixes the quarks, and out will come cross-sections, the distributions and rapidity or in parameters dimension, or in the case of a Monte Carlo, uh, some events. Right, so this is really a very schematic, I think, what you now have a picture of. Uh, this is beautiful, and practice is a bit more involved, the flowchart, so the weakest link is always updated or input to something else, which you then use for something else, but the basic calculation uh, s scheme is the previous one, so I will not go through this flowchart in detail, uh, but um, uh, this is more precisely how, how it works. You always update the weakest bit if you can. Now, this may be also worthwhile to spend a bit of time on these particle distribution functions, which I've mentioned here and there, the ones that come out of the particle model. Uh, there's a lot of text here, I will not read it all out. Uh, but what is clear, I think, from the lectures is that you must know them very accurately. I mean, you multiply every calculation at the particle level that you do with them, and if these things are not known very accurately, your whole prediction is not known very accurately. So what you need to determine then is 11 PDFs, five for the quarks, up, down, strange, and five for the antiquarks, anti-up, anti-down, and the blue up. And their uncertainties. We must be able to judge how well we know things. So this has really been a development of the last 10 years that people have been quantifying the uncertainties. Now, schematically, how do you do it? Well, I've told you that these things are universal, but we cannot compute them from first principles. So what do we do? We sacrifice, or we take a number of experiments that are particularly sensitive to some of these PDFs. And for those, we will, we will accept that we will not be able to predict them. Rather, we will use those theory experiment confrontations to uh, fit, to infer what these are. So we have some experimental data on some observable O and its uncertainty. And uh, that said, we said equal to the theoretical prediction, the PDFs and then the quartonic cross-section plus the uncertainty. And from this, we fit these phi's. Now, in doing this, a number of groups employ slightly different strategies, and here are the abbreviations. Uh, it's also important to note the nomenclature. Uh, if this quartonic calculation is at order NLO, then the fit to the PDFs is an NLO fit. If you do an NLO calculation here, you fit NLO PDFs. If you only do a leading order calculation, these are only leading order PDFs. The data are always all orders, right? The data are the data. So it is out of the fit that the PDFs also get this nomenclature, but not because they are themselves always a purely perturbative expression. It's more that's what, what you get out of the fit. So here is our D 
deep lab evolution equation, that's how we evolve them. If you measure them at some scale, you then can compute them to any other scale using the deep lab evolution. Um, well, we have derived them already. So here's a bit of a instruction as to and what the present status is. We now have three loop stripping functions and that's good for n or low cross sections. But let's get a, a, get a little bit to this comparison of theory and experiment to infer these uh, phi's. So to get the best possible fit for these 11 PDFs, you need to have the right choice of data. So, because uh, if you then uh, get them, then each of the, uh, hopefully, experiments that are each a bit differently sensitive to these PDFs, so that they really, that the 11 of them, you can constrain them well. This is, by the way, typically what they look like at the low value of Q squared of 10. You see typically, that, uh, this is from the uh, MSPW set, the up fork density, the down density, the strange, the charm, the blue one density divided by 10, it's huge. You see the bands indicate the uncertainties at that scale. Uh, the, the little bumps here reflect the fact that the up and the down are valence quarks. They make up the proton, whereas the blue one uh, really goes up all the way, and certainly the strange and the charm, uh, they go up straight without the bump. If you then use deep lab to evolve to higher scales, 10 to the 4 GeV squared, you see that it all gets much steeper and the bands get much narrower. So there's a focusing effect in the evolution. But still, the uncertainties are there. So here are some, uh, just a list. There's a very nice review by Porter and Watt on this, uh, of the typical processes uh, that whose data go into that fit. What sub-process particularly is involved, so that indicates also which particular type of parton you're sensitive to, and uh, what X-range particularly they're good at. So let's take one. Uh, classically, is deep elastic scattering here. So this is just uh, uh, this basically this one. You see that it's sensitive to the up and the down fork mostly. It's sensitive to all of them, but mostly up and down fork. If you would use this one, e plus e minus the cc bar, you make a cc bar for here that always needs a gluon in the initial state. So this particular reaction is particularly sensitive to the gluon density. Because you see, that's what you need in first instance to come out of the proton. Another one here is uh, the jet production. So you make uh, uh, one jet and something else. And uh, that is sensitive to, uh, well, depending on the X range, also on the quark and the gluon density. So you have this mixture. Another criterion is that these must be very well measured. If these have huge errors, they're useless in the fit. You must have good measurements, good theory, then you get a good fit. Um, I'm not sure I should address uh, this. This is more the, the, the little technical details of how you do this, how you set up this fit of 11 dimensional, um, uh, of, of the 11 functions that you need. Uh, perhaps it's useful to see the particularly interesting, particularly key question is when you have f 11 functions to determine, the space of function is, is infinite. So how can you with a finite set of data uh, determine an infinite uh, set of functions in infinite dimensional space? Now this has been solved a little bit for uh, without bias in a neural net uh, setting, which I will not go into much here, but that's a really quite uh, interesting approach. Uh, the other approaches that use Hessian techniques, the inverse of the, of the double derivative matrix, that also uh, uh, produces uh, uh, densities with very, very little bias. And the two sets, the two approaches agree in almost all cases very, very well. Uh, except in a very few cases, and I must admit this is a bit of an older plot, so these things are certainly updated. You see here different sets of densities for the, uh, the ratio of, uh, uh, of MSPW to uh, CTEC 10, I think. And you see how they agree. Uh, so there's, there's a number of comparisons here also for alpha S for the different sets of densities and for the gluon, gluon to Higgs cross section. So there's a lot of stages at which you can compare how these different sets of PDFs made by different groups uh, compare with each other. You see also that uh, certainly at very large energies or very large X, the uncertainties are still appreciable. But most of the cross sections pick up their energies, uh, their values here. So this is a very mature business, but a very important one too, to, to get this right. Okay. So much over the PDFs uh, at this stage. 
We had also addressed the issue of infrared divergences. I skipped here the story of the UV divergences. And we had seen that uh, there, very important, is the spinosita Nauenberg theorem, which is even true quantum mechanically. And it says that the transition probability uh, to a set of degenerate states gets a finite answer. So for the case of a jet, here is a jet indicated both the splitting and the virtual correction are part of a jet. So these two, are, these two states are mutually degenerate. And if you add them up, the divergences cancel. If that happens, if you have an observable, such as a jet cross-section with the appropriate definition of a jet, then you have an infrared safe observable, one in which the notically now the theorem applies. Right. Certainly for, uh, and that will be sufficient for E plus E minus collisions. As long as you don't have an initial state Hadron, this is enough to make your cross-section finite. Now, for reactions with initial state hadrons, we had looked at the Berlian process, proton-antiproton collisions to lepton-antilepton, uh, plus anything else. And uh, it has a storied uh, history um, with a lot of discoveries. I'll get to that in just a moment. And we use it often as a theory laboratory, as the first non-trivial case where you can test out your ideas. So, uh, and particularly the issue, is KLN also sufficient for reactions with initial state hadrons? Now, the Berlian history, uh, here's some actual plots. So this is uh, uh, the discovery of the J psi. In, uh, I think these are data from, oh, where it's from? I think it's Brookhaven. Uh, I'm not sure now, suddenly. But the, you see here a peak in uh, the E plus E minus spectrum around 3.1 GeV, which is exactly where the J psi sits. So and that's a Brillian process, really. The same thing for a Fermilab uh, in 77, the Upsilon, that's a BB bond down state, as opposed to a CP bond down state here. And you see here really at, uh, uh, I think this should be 10, I think, I'm going to do this right here. Um, oh, sorry, this is a, uh, this is not, this is the Z photon. This is a 90 GeV. Uh, that was discovered at UA1 and UA2. But there's a similar plot as this one for the Upsilon discovery. And the last example of Brillian making a discovery is really Brillian with initial state gluons making through a top top loop a Higgs that then decays. But it's like a Brillian like process. So the Brillian process is uh, very important also physically. So the problem was that, oh, this is a, because of the slide, uh, I deleted the slide. The problem at the initial stage is that you can have an incoming parton and then radiating the opposite gluon. And that is not covered by Spinoza uh, Nauenberg theorem because the initial state is precisely defined. There is no set of degenerate initial states. So what you can do uh, is renormalize the PDFs. This is the equation we wrote down. Uh, the bare PDF is the renormalized PDF plus this extra counter term, a new source of one of the epsilons that cancels the one that you found in your diagrams. So this is the picture of factorization. KLN does not work. There is a one of the epsilon, but after we renormalize the PDFs, you get a second source of one of the epsilons that then cancels the one that you had. And the byproduct of this was by the DGLAT equation. We had uh, covered that as well. So this is here the argument that I gave also in class that uh, also intuitively this makes sense because if this is very, very close to being collinear, this is a very long-lived state, so the splitting can occur long before the hard scattering. Is really rather part of the proton than of the, the hard scattering. So absorbing this into the proton makes sense. We had uh, discussed then the whole story of next to leading order corrections uh, for Drillian, which is simple enough, at least the formulas fit on one line. Uh, that is usually not the case. Uh, in fact, in the whole MLO calculational scene, there has been a revolution of uh, calculations. And um, I'd like to maybe give you a, a brief look at uh, why that is the case, uh, what was the key idea, uh, just in a very brief sketch. So not in detail, uh, but the idea is that if you have two to n particles, and with a one-loop correction, that can be a very complicated diagram. But all one-loop amplitudes 
This is E, can be written as a sum of box integrals, triangle, bubbles, and tangles. So the worst you can have is a box or propagated. And it's really set in essence because we live in four dimensions. Uh, that is a tool in all of this, but the but the key fact, the key useful fact is this: uh, so that this th that statement does not depend on the integration by part. Integration part is one of the tools that you need. So in the picture, that no matter how complicated the one-loop integration, always write as the sum of a box integrals, triangles, bubbles, and tangles. And the goal then of the, and by now we have a complete list of all these integrals. The goal then is just can we find a quick way to get these coefficients rather than compute the whole thing. And this you can find using uh, taking cuts through diagrams, setting certain lines on shell using complex analysis. And if you do it to this diagram, it turns out that most of these, if you do the same thing on the right-hand side, most of these are zero, but one or two are not. And that way you can start picking off the various terms. You do that very judiciously. So, so that's what you would basically do. So what is then the status, uh, more or less, of high order calculations in QCD. Well, if you do two to one processes, think Grelian, then up to n cubed, although certainly for Higgs production is known, Grelian not quite yet. For two to two process, we have n or low calculations. And for everything else, we have n or low calculations uh, because they're fully automatized now. We also have for this case, uh, F2 is also known to n cubed LO. <laughs> and for these things, we have both automated exact Calculations without parts and showers, black hat, MCFM, etc. And um, including parts and showers, you have AMC and MLO. <coughs> but sometimes MLO is not enough. Uh, this is a nice plot, uh, always like to show by Anastasi, Dixon, Melnikov, and Puntiello, showing that you, if you didn't do, in this case, the N MLO calculation, you drew the wrong conclusions. So this is the production of a Z boson uh, at the Tevatron. Uh, and look at the rapidity, so the direction, how far along the beam are you with that Z boson. And it's a shape like this, and the data are indicated. Um, now, if you only did a leading order calculation, you got this. So a pretty small error, uh, but clearly discrepant with the data. Now, if you, say, you say, well, okay, we know leading order is optimal, but let's do an extra leading order calculation, then you get this band here, and you would still be uh, discrepant. And if you say, well, next leading order should work, so we have new physics. We have seen something that is contributing to the data that is not in the theory. However, in this case, the MLO correction does go through the data. So you really needed to, to do that calculation here. You also see the progression is very nice. It is very unlikely that the N cubed LO would go here. Right, the progression is quite nice. Large correction and then a much smaller correction. So here is a nice case of NLO being needed. So uh, then we turned to uh, all orders in QCD, uh, the field of resummation. And um, we, what we have discussed so far is uh, PDS, partial distribution functions, what they mean, how they are made, how they are fit. We discussed three level calculations, which are automatized. At NLO, we discussed divergences and their removal. But also this has been automatized these days. So uh, this topic is about can we say something systematic about all orders even though we cannot compute them exactly. And resummation is the field that tries to do that. So this is a schematic plot. You've seen these formulas before and wrote them on the board. When you have a typical behavior for an observable uh, where you get per order in the coupling alpha two powers of some large logarithm extra and all subleading powers. And this is bad for perturbation theory. And this one stands for anything that is not the large logarithm. So the expected parameter is alpha log squared. And how do you fix this? Well, uh, the most, the, the thing that we try at least is to uh, reorganize, resum the terms, use the pattern that exists in these logarithms to find an analytical form here that sums all the logarithms into a form, into an analytical form, almost always an exponent, times a residue series which has no longer the logs. And things, you have leading order, next to leading order, next to next leading order, the same here, you have leading log, next to leading log, etc. just by including more and more in the exponent. 
Now, you, of course, you have two uh, ways often of computing, a fixed order and we sum, and you must also be able to combine them. Many people do. How do you do that consistently? Well, here is uh, downstairs, you could keep the leading term only that is good for a leading log next to next leading log, etc. You can sort of see by following the scheme what you need to include. Now, how do you combine this with an uh, exact calculation? So, well, it's actually quite simple. The MLO matched is to the next to leading order uh, calculation. Take the resum form and expand it to the next to leading order, which will not be the full answer, but the approximate answer. Uh, subtract that and then add the full resum. That way you're not double counting. Right, so up to next to leading order, you have the exact answer, and beyond, you have all these approximate logarithmic terms. Very schematically, it's true for most hyperfree summations, um, whatever the log is. Now, what can L then be the logarithm of? Uh, that will come uh, uh, later, I think. But let me first uh, discuss the benefits of doing that. Well, first of all, uh, trying to get these all order forms can rescue predictive power, uh, particularly when perturbative theorems converge poorly. Uh, this is a way of trying to get it to work. And in many cases, that has really worked. Uh, you can also use this formula. Suppose you have this formula, but you haven't computed beyond L alone yet, to expand it to the next order and sort of get a first impression of the term there. It won't be complete, but you get the logarithms there. And that can be useful. But you always must realize it is not exact. Uh, so you get uh, predict terms have an approximate MLO you can do. Typically, you also get a better physics description. I'll show you an example of that later in the QT distribution. And also, this is an important one, the uncertainty, theoretical uncertainty in your calculation from varying the renormalization or the factorization scale is lessened by all order calculations. So uh, particularly for the top cross section and the Higgs cross section, you can really uh, notice it. Uh, for example, here you see this is NMLO, this is for the Higgs, the top core cross section, and if you include resummation, the uncertainty is smaller. Right? So it really helps you uh, narrow the uncertainty uh, on predictions. This, uh, by the way, is, uh, is, was a, a, a very important calculation for the next to next to leading order Peter Bar cross section for both Tevatron and LHC, but it has been enhanced further beyond that by the resummation, the threshold resummation. And it works beautifully with the data. It really are every time you change the energy to LHC, it's right on top of it, which is good news for QCD, bad news for if you're looking for new physics. Um, so this is also thanks to lots of new calculational methods that can be used elsewhere as well. And of course, you can reverse now the things. You can now use the fact that the TT bar cross section is both well calculated and well measured, and now start using it in the pediatrics. And people start doing that. For Higgs production, this is a, a particular calculation, including also the, the, uh, the full uh, factor V. There's an exact NQ below calculation, which is not in here, but it has some of the similar features. This is Higgs production cross section to NNLO plus NQ LL resummation. And what is plotted on the horizontal axis is the renormalization scale up, equal to the factorization scale for various types of calculations. Here you see the leading order calculation varies quite a bit as you vary Q. The next to leading order calculation still varies a lot in vertical sense as you vary Q. It's only here the, the best one, the solid line, when you include all this, that it becomes quite independent of the new variation. So the theoretical uncertainty is this band. Whereas at MLO, it was all of this. Right, so here, this is for uh, two different uh, approximations. And it, in both cases, this is the lots of Ns uh, lead to very little scale dependence. So that's the benefit of resummation. Now, I had not yet said the log of what? Uh, I left it on the previous slide as a cliffhanger. So it all depends on what you measure. Uh, so we have, we have here a bunch of logs collected together. Uh, you could, for example, look at the Z boson produced in proton-anti-proton collision and plot the PT, or the, the transit momentum of the Z boson. So a very small transit momentum, uh, this is 
this is the fact of misinformation. We we start come back to this. For thrust, this uh, final state shape variable for e plus e minus, uh, very near thrust, uh, very one near thrust is relative zero. This is the recent an area where log square one minus the thrust occurs. And also uh, the PT spectrum of the bottom block of the well, There's many situations, these are just three random ones. Let me first look at uh, one of these thrusts. So this is E plus E minus collisions producing some final state. And the thrust is a variable that says, what does the final state look like? If it is a half, it's very spherical. All particles come out in all directions in the same way. Near T is one, thrust is one, the final state looks like two narrow jets coming out. So the logs then are the log square of one minus the thrust. So near that two jet limit. So here you see uh, old data from Aleph, uh, reading, next reading, next, next reading, but still not quite describing the data. And this is in a resum calculation using uh, SCAT techniques. And now you really see, uh, so you add NLL, NLL, etc. The resummation has been added to the fixed order, and now it all looks consistent with each other and with the data. This is a very nice plot. Right? This is the fixed order and renormalization of Hoopman Krug. The second example is recoil. So we have the Z boson here made. And uh, if you don't have any re uh, emission, then the Z boson must have zero PT because the two incoming quarks have zero to become a lot of z-axis. You cannot make momentum in this direction. But if you have one emission, you can recoil against that. Right? The, B, the PT of the z-boson will be minus the PT of the gluon. But if the gluon is soft, this will be very small PT. So if you plot the PT, then particularly at low PT, that's where you expect soft gluons in the summation to be relevant. Now, if you see the data here, these are from all data from day zero, it goes up and then at some point turn over. The fixed order calculation goes up and does not come down. Only with some calculations go around. So this is the best example really of showing why resummation describes the physics better than uh, fixed order. Only resummation gets the, the turnover right. And this is just to show you indeed even in the Monte Carlo that as you do only have only these two diagrams, no resummation, only one emission, it will go up forever. It's a divergence really near P, PT is zero, because if PT goes to zero, this line goes on shelf. So if you look at the cross section, order by order at low PT, you find here the lowest order term, PT must be zero, and then a logarithmic double log term, etc. And you can sum all this, and in the end, the resummed expression looks roughly like this, exponent, minus a constant times the log square. And now you see why the curve turns over. When PT becomes very, very small, the log square becomes very, very large. We get e to the minus a large number. So cross-section dies. This is also what the parton shower does. The parton shower produces this behavior. So they, it also turns over just like the data do. So a third example, uh, we've also encountered the threshold logs in Guelian. So when the partonic S is just a little larger than Q squared. And um, uh, typically this leads to larger cross sections. That's why experiments love it. Uh, well, it is also a feature of theory. And this we have looked at before. Uh, where does double logs in that case come from? Well, from these kind of interference effects, we have looked at these intervals, if you remember right, by working this out. And we got found a double pole and the accompanying log square. Now, to look at all orders, we have looked at the iconal approximation. Uh, we have seen, this is the story from QED, the soft photons being exchanged. The one exchange led to this expression, and the two photon exchange, if you sum them up and relabel, you don't do an interval, you just get one half of this expression squared. And you see then the whole exponential series of forming. Right, it was a beautiful QED result. And in QCD, uh, it is a bit more tricky. And here, in QCD, I didn't talk about this too much. The key optic is often a quark radiating off lots of gluons, but at every vertex is a Q SU3 generator. And this you describe this whole system as a so-called Wilson light that form in the formula looks like this. But if you expand this in the coupling, you get all these diagrams. 
So also in QCD, we have an exponentiation, the sum of all diagrams with their color packet is the exponent of a reduced set, webs, and change color packets, and only those diagrams that you couldn't cut in two with two snips of the lines were in the exponent. So this is a beautiful exponentiation theorem, web exponentiation, that is an important part of resummation. Uh, so that's for, for amplitudes and diagrams. Uh, what about cross-sections? Uh, so how do we sum a cross-section? I've indicated it a little bit. I didn't go into great detail. There are, in fact, many ways. It is not like fixed order. You just write the primary rules, write all the diagrams, compute, and that's it. So it depends, uh, in some sense, on what observable you're looking at, what type of logarithm you're looking at for that observable, who is doing it. That also depends uh, a little bit. Uh, it al that also influences the method. And the key notion that we always take is the notion of factorization. We discussed this, factorization of UV modes and finite modes. And the factorization immediately implies some kind of uh, resummation. But let me give you a bit of a, uh, of a different way, yet again, a very intuitive way, perhaps. Resummation 101 for cross-sections. So let's imagine we have some interesting particle P that we produce an N extra soft gluons with four momenta K1 to Kn. And for the cross-section, we have then the phase space for that and the matrix element, the, the sum of all the diagrams for it. And now we assume all these gluons to be soft. And then we can make some approximations, the icon approximation. But first of all, if you look at the phase space, we can drop all the Ks in the overall momentum conserving delta function. And essentially, the phase space measure factorizes into n of these one particle phase space measures, one for each of the k's, and then there's an the identical particle factor for one of the n tutorial. The matrix element squared also starts, uh, factorizes in the Arcona approximation to the one emission probability squared to the nth power. If you now combine the phase space and the matrix element, then you immediately see an exponential forming, something to the n, one of n tutorial. So this is a very rough argument, uh, but you see here why it occurs. By the nth, one of the n tutorial, in this case, from identical particles. So here's the exponentiation of the one emission with the one emission phase space. Now, as it stands, it is not a particularly interesting result because this is just a number. So what you'd like is to have some kind of delta function here, or a theta function that makes it a distribution. But if you do that, it must also factorize and fit this story, or it cannot go into the exponent. So for example, if you want to do threshold resummation, you insert a delta function like this into your phase space, but the sum of all the energies must be 1 minus z. If you do transverse momentum resummation, so the sum of all the transverse momenta of these k's must be the total transverse momentum of particle p. Now, we can, these are functions, or delta functions, that don't look like a product, but they do once you take a transform. So if I take, for example, a Fourier transform of this, then it just becomes, with respect to D here, you see it just becomes a product of these exponents here. And for this one, you do a Laplace transform or a Mellon transform, and it also becomes a product. So now you can go and put it in the exponent. Now you have N dependence or B dependence. And it's now resummed. Of course, at the end, we sum the large logs or logs of n or logs of b. At the end, you must still go back. You must redo the inverse transform. But it was useful to get uh, the, uh, a variable differential distribution into your resummation. And for the resum, Trillian and Higgs cross section, I've given you that formula. Uh, we also saw that this is the, this is the result, the inverse Mellon transform of this expression, and the Higgs cross-section looks very similar, where A and B are known each the third order in perturbation theory. And this plot shows uh, that uh, for some toy PDFs, just to see how well the formula behaves, the progression from leading to next to leading to next to next to genome is quite nice. It really gets, the corrections are smaller here than this step. So it's a nice convergent behavior. We had also discussed this morning uh, Monte Carlo. So this is a slide to uh, remind you of Monte Carlo integration. And this is the cross-section as a multidimensional 
Monte Carlo integral. You can, e you can easily handle 30 dimensions or so as a sum over weights, where these r random numbers, these events, are uh, drawn from a uniform distribution. And you fill the histogram for each event with a weight, that is the matrix element squared. Event generation was the unweighting uh, of this event with hit and miss, or with the V2 algorithm. That was more making it act like nature bands. So uh, we had hit and miss. Well, I, I will not make an exercise. At, uh, you can look at it again, but it was quite easy. The V2 algorithm I did not go in detail to, but it does unweight a function like this. So the probability of a branching is the probability of a branching at time t times the probability that nothing has branched yet until time t. And this is the Sudikov form factor. And well, here's actually a slide with the V2 algorithm. I will not go through it other than to remark that this plot I made myself some time ago when I was starting to work in this. And you see the analytical result and the little uh, the little algorithm, and it works quite nicely. It's kind of fun. So I just took this form and then uh, implemented this, and uh, it seems to work well. So that was a bit of a review of the whole uh, course in a, in a, a very fast uh, fashion, um, catching up a little bit of time from the beginning. So we had seen in this Gian course many concepts in perturbative QCD. I tried to discuss both the essence of them, the physics, what's behind them, and also some technical aspects. I think that is important to address as well. You don't really understand things until you can manage those two. Some formal aspects we discussed, symmetries of the Lagrangian, the, the procedure, the technique, and also the idea behind renormalization, the notion of asymptotic freedom in QCD. We had spent particularly time also on the infrared and collinear sector. How do you handle the divergences there? And how does that lead to actual finite orders, not infinite orders? I mean, a finite order, but infinite contributions. We had then gone also to all orders, the resummation, why one resums, and a little bit how, what is behind the fact that you can write all order structures in perturbation fields. And we had seen, and today, this morning, actually, the principles of particle showers and Monte Carlos. So I really try to stress that QCD is not just well learned to do diagrams and that's it. There's a lot of physics behind all these aspects, a lot of things to understand, a lot of subtleties. It makes it really challenging. Uh, and uh, well, I find it quite fascinating too. So my hope is that in the future, after this course, when you go to workshops or you just listen to talks and you hear all these words, that you now have a bit of a sense of what it is about. Um, and that besides the technicalities, you develop your own little intuition in uh, QCD. I think it's important to take this as a starting point and start doing that. And don't be afraid of doing that. So take the course as a starting need for reading up on this. Stay in touch with each other, I would say, and form a Facebook group or something like that, where you, because you're a community in India that is a bit special. You're people interested in QCD theory, uh, young students interested in QCD theory. And no need to, uh, to go back to institutions and see each other in four or five years. But exchange ideas. If you have questions, ask them to each other. There's always someone who, who knows. Uh, so take it as a starting point for reading up on this and working, developing these ideas uh, further that are interesting for you and relevant to you in your own research. So I've certainly been very impressed by you. You've really been paying a lot of attention. And you've uh, asked very good questions. and. Uh, uh, I wish I had students always like that. It's really uh, very, very good. So you should always not be afraid to discuss. Even if the question sounds stupid, that's okay. Just uh, don't be afraid. There's always The other person doesn't know as much either, uh, as you've no doubt discovered when you ask me questions. So always discuss with other QCD theorists and experimenters also. Don't forget that. Right? They learn. You can learn a lot from them. I certainly did when I started doing this. And... Uh, when you have questions or ideas. So uh, with that, I can only say uh, QCD out, and I should drop the mic, but I. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention and all this work. Thank you.